Uh, I think it was uh, uh, to sum it up, one of the most interesting part of the session, as you can see also we have got uh, newcomers coming to the table. Uh, let's see who will start this session. That is yard. All right, we'll start with you because you haven't been on the stage. Uh, just to maybe to put into perspective, what are the challenges that we face as humanitarian organization in uh, either collecting or implementation of zakat, especially in this modern time? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Indeed, that's a very pertinent question. I think for us that are involved in humanitarian fraternity in the, in the humanitarian space, with regards to zakat, in today's times, people are still very, very particular. And there's a range and a barrage of questions which donors throw out to you as to how you will execute the farad of zakat. In fact, some of them say to us, you know, when we go to the masjid, we have an imam, the imam performs the salah. If the salah of the imam is invalid, our salah is, not, is, not, is, not, is also invalid. Similarly, when we entrust you with our zakat, how do we know? How will we know that it is then discharged accordingly? So these are some of the challenges that we have. But alhamdulillah, how we do curb that, we have our ulama on board at every level of the organization. And then they are there to help and assist donors, to comfort them, to give them that confidence that the zakat is eventually discharged accordingly within the paradigm and within the rules and regulations of the sharia. Suhail, I think you have been in this sector for quite a long time, 20 years, from 19 years old, you started to, you know, to interact in this field. Uh, are there any, or oh, especially when you look at technology, how do we actually leverage technology uh, to actually collect zakat, administer zakat, and as well as deploy it? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. This is a very interesting uh, question because I can see that if we leverage technology, we can create a transparency on our zakah. So from the point of collection uh, to the point of discharging, if we utilize technology uh, in terms of uh, data collection, in terms of how things are dispensed, uh, we are able to then ensure that uh, that our zakah is being spent. As there's, a, there's distrust, you know, sometimes amongst uh, donors. So in this way, there's very easy uh, transparency. So for example, uh, we know um, like Ashraf al Aid has, uh, uses a zakah database called Zahza developed by al Fida Foundation. And uh, all uh, 38,000 uh, beneficiaries that we support uh, uh, over the year, you know, there's a clear track record how much each person was given, which, what's the, the family uh, demographic. So, uh, so in this way, it's very clear, very transparent, and even you can have a zakah audit on it, and alhamdulillah, I think uh, this is uh, the way that uh, we need to uh, look at, uh, at, uh, at uh, discharging our zakah, inshallah. If I can just add in on that there, uh... Alhamdulillah, there is some kind of collaboration amongst like-minded organizations with regards to how we uh, assess zakat recipients. And of course, yes, I think all the organizations are on the same page that we try our utmost best to make sure that the zakat is discharged accordingly. And Alhamdulillah, to a great level, most of donors, most of donors are very much satisfied as to the steps that we are taking in helping to make sure that zakat is discharged correctly. Uh, this one is for Brother Davis from Down Under. I think this question will come from the audience. Jazakallah uh, khair for this uh, important uh, conversation about zakat. It's, like you mentioned, it's uh, an issue which a lot of people are, are, have concerns about the execution of it. My two questions that I, I needed to ask is that um, sometimes uh, the, the, the issue of ownership is one thing that is uh, <clears throat> always discussed regarding uh, zakat. Uh, we have some situations where a, uh, 
for example, you have a model where a, a, an Islamic village is created and the houses are given to the beneficiaries uh, as, 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 as the ownership is given to them. But there is an element of conditionality that if they, or if they want to sell, they are, they have the, they are allowed to sell it, uh, but it has to be sold with certain, certain uh, uh, conditions that are given. How would that, how would that work in, uh, in, in the context of the cut when you have those kind of conditions? Uh, second thing is also uh, the issue regarding zakat and wakaf. There's a conversation that has been going on for some time. How can zakat or can zakat be used uh, uh, for wakaf investments, and if so, how so? Uh, I think there's, there is some discussion that has been going on. Uh, I don't know how uh, what the panel thinks on, on that and what the what the view is regarding that. I I didn't know I was going to give fatwas when I came to. <laughs> Uh, um, that's two tough questions. That's actually it's, it's questions for I gave the the the, the, the sheikhs. But uh, in the first one, the issue of tamlik or, or the issue of ownership, my understanding anyway is that you cannot put a condition on anything when you give somebody zakah. Um, when you give them the zakah, you cannot put a condition on it of that if you did something and something, you have to give something back or you have to do specific things. Once you, it's like somebody zakah is. If they fall in the eight categories, it is their right. So it's like somebody's lost their money. You picked it up, and it's, it's you giving his money back. So my, that's my understanding. Molana can correct me if I'm wrong in relation to that, because we actually don't work in the international space, so we, we, we seldom don't have that type of question. But we sometimes have it in, in, in a much more localized sense, where somebody comes and they say they need help with their rent, or they need help with food, and you give them the zakah, and they spend it on something else, and they come back, and then they need help with the rent again. There's nothing you can do. You, they basically, you, if they still need help, we can help them. But obviously, there's conditions where they, you can be wiser in the way you do that. Um, the second question was um, wakaf. So uh, wakaf is becoming a big thing, and wakaf and saka are two separate matters. As a matter of fact, now in, in, in Malaysia, Indonesia, Turkey, they have saka and wakaf organizations. So wakaf is something else that we as a community uh, anyway, in Australia, I don't know about South Africa, have not really, really understood and seen the potential and used the potential of the wakaf. Turkey has done that very, very well for many, many years. You see the masjids in Turkey, uh, and the brothers from Turkey can correct me if I'm wrong, they have it designed in such a way that the, the shops around and everything around that is all wakaf, and it actually supports the, 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 the masjid. So wakaf money, the things that we can do is basically get money for the community. Now, putting money of zakah into wakaf, uh, because we have to distribute the zakah money within one year of having received it. So you can't actually put zakah money into wakaf as far as I understand. Molana can correct me if I'm wrong in any of that. So with regards to the ownership, remember, once ownership has been given, once zakat has been given, there is no such thing as conditional aid or conditional zakah. That concept does not exist at all whatsoever. That is how we discharge the zakah. Ownership must take place. Yes, of course, we can advise, we can try to ask the person, you know, in a nice way, in a humble way. Advice is there, but ultimately, once the person has taken ownership of the zakah, he is free to do what he wants. If that individual has conditions put upon him through the zakah, then that zakah is not discharged. So these are very important points. Once again, we're going to, into a lot of jurisprudence and we don't want to turn this panel discussion into a jurisprudence. I don't think we are major muftis here. But because we are in this space, we can comment here and there. But ultimately, this is for a deeper discussion for muftis to, do, to discuss. But ultimately, the principles are the, the, the same. We will take uh, Mufti Jakura's question, then we'll go to Brother Mukbil, inshallah. Just one minute. A comment from the floor. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Jazakallah to the brothers for the excellent presentation. Just got a comment on zakat that uh, I think uh, the organizations should be engaging with the international fiqh academies. There's a lot of work that's being done in uh, Mu'amalat or even like the Islamic fiqh academy of Jidda. And one of the key issues, I know it might be somewhat controversial, but it's something that's been debated and it's in our kitabs, the giving of zakat to non-Muslims. 
And many, many, the common understanding is that it will fall under the category of Mu'allafatul Qulub. That's not the only category. In fact, there is a view of Hazrat Umar radiallahu anh, where there was a distinction between fuqara and masakin, where one was Muslim and the other one was non I'm not saying this is the fatwa, please don't misunderstand, but in the context, for example, in, in a South African context, where there's a need, there's, I mean, we perhaps, I think, among the most unequal countries in the world, definitely we need to draw from the knowledge that is in international uh, FIC academies and try and engage and enhance the, uh, the impact that Zakah can have. Shukran. Uh, Brother Mukbil should be ready for my, for my question. Jazakallah khair, Brother Ismail, for a really very fruitful and powerful message. By the way, last week I had a meeting with uh, Dr. Suhail, the CEO of National Zakat Foundation in the UK. He visited me in Manchester to discuss how many things about this. My question to you is a little bit strategic question. Because you mentioned the one point something trillion. I enjoyed several times to hear and read to Prince Hassan of Jordan. I don't know if you heard about him. So Prince Hassan of Jordan, after his retirement from politics, he is writing and talking about different initiatives. And one of them, Zakat. And so he's constantly emphasized the importance of zakat as more than just a religious obligation. He advocates for zakat as a crucial tool of a human dignity and social solidarity. In his vision, zakat should be institutionalized at a global level to create an inclusive and effective charity system. His focus is on transforming the traditional charity model to one that is systematic and addresses broad, broader issues such as poverty, inequality, human suffering, particularly for displaced and unprivileged community. So just the point in the end, he said, he suggests establishment of a global zakat institution. So, and in his writing, he said, governments will not do that. However, organizations can work together in a global level to establish that kind of system. What do you think, Brother Ismail? Can you initiate something and we are behind you? <laughs> I, I, look, I'd love to initiate something. And I, and I think, I think uh, th looking forward and being positive, I think we could do it. We could probably not reach where it's going to be, I mean, we can't agree in the morning in Australia, but so, but uh, some of the things we can do, and I think the younger generation and, the, and, and our powerful sisters and everybody, there's many more organizations now than there was 10 years ago that says we will collaborate and we'll work together. And as the brother used the, my favorite words as we, it's like-minded, right? So there's enough like-minded organizations and people that I think we could take a step towards that direction. And for the next generation to say and take it another step, it maybe take us 50 years. But the problem we have, if you get too big and you become a conglomerate of this, then it will again the the work on the ground might 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 um, be affected by that. And as you know, it gets to government level, and now like you can see in a country like India, where they're trying to take the wakaf rules, right? Because they understand the power and the uh, the, the money in there. I think for us, for the next five years, if we just as an organization, like-minded, like organizations to work together, like in Australia, we have four or five organizations working together for the very first time in many, many decades to help with the Palestinians. And, and then we can continue that, that, that and then uh, Dr. Sahel, our UK, we're in five countries and we're trying to do that across the Western countries we are in. By the way, this uh, panel, it seems like an oral examination. <laughs> okay, what we can do now, since you don't want to be examined, we will uh, I just uh, have a few words from uh, both of you just to conclude There's this session. There. there is a question this from the system. Oh, you can bring the mic left to screen.
Assalamu alaikum, me again. Uh, Brother Ismail, I have a question. Uh, we have this National Zakat Foundation also in Germany. And uh, the brothers and sisters from that organization in Germany says that the zakat money should always stay in the country where it's being collected. And uh, they even say that it is not or it should, it is not allowed to be uh, being distributed in other countries. And uh, since, for example, we don't have such a great, uh, I say, social uh, inequality in Germany, isn't it fair to just locate this money, for example, in other neighboring countries, for example, Bosnia or Montenegro or Kosovo, or should we just leave the money from 5.5 uh, million Muslim people living in Germany, the zakat money, should it stay in Germany or can it be relocated uh, in other countries? Thank you. So as you can see, the hadith from Maad ibn Jabal, where he basically fulfilled the rights of this. So all five madhabs agreed that firstly, it should be distributed where it was collected, but it does not stay that you cannot send, send the money anywhere else. So in the world we live today, because the world is basically a small world now and everybody's connected. And we see that there's organizations that, that concentrate and specialize international aid. And then there's those like in South Africa, Sansev is one of the main ones that deals with the local ones. Ashwal Aid does local as well. But I think if we collaborate and don't duplicate, and we make sure that nobody is left not taken care of, that's not an easy task, but it's a task that is, we are responsible for. So we will first be answerable for those that are closest to us. Right? So there's no point in saying I'm helping. It's like your children are not eating, but you're sending food down, to, to down the road. So we need to make sure that those closest to us physically are, are taken care of and then we can help the others but we have the uh, beautiful t situation today where we have organizations taking care so we don't all have to do the same thing as a matter of fact one of the recommendations i have is that if some of the big uh, ngos uh, charities in the world can get together and say okay guys where are you working where are you working where are you working and we don't all work in the same countries and do the same things in the same countries so then everybody can spend money like in a specific area, et cetera, et cetera. And that's something that we could consider as well. I think we can uh, go into concluding remarks from the panel. One minute each. One more, one more. Oh, two. We will start with the sister, then we'll come with you. I'm glad to see everybody's passionate about Zaka. Yeah, of course you can. It's like praying sunnah. <laughs> you can, you can. The more you give, the better, because you don't show 100% whether you calculate it accurately. It's always better to give them more. And give it to Ashraf <laughs> Alayt. <laughs> you give it the extra. <laughs> Sheikh Bilal sent you, huh? Okay, um, my question is in light of accountability and uh, transparency, uh, how do we educate the donor with regards to uh, admin costs and distribution of funds because they will ask. So you have that difficulty where in light of the Quran and Sunnah, they are like favorable, um, basically initiatives like feeding the poor and you know, taking care of the orphan. So how do, we, how do we educate them in terms of, uh, you know, where to get the money where it's most needed? So I think for the donors, the donors need to wake up, really. And, and, and we can help the donors wake up because I, I haven't seen anybody go to the imam and ask him, did he make wudu before he prayed, right? So what happens is that the, the donors need to understand if you have organizations where you can trust them and we start working together and the runs are on the board and stuff like that. The biggest worry we have before we go to bed is whether we fulfill the amana of the zakah money. It's not an easy task. As a matter of fact, some people say, I can't do this work, right? It's an amana that we have every single day. Remember, when you work in zakah, you're doing Allah's work every day. There's no better job than this. So once the donors start trusting, right? And there's some good organizations and you feel like Sheikh Mawlana Suhailia, don't keep asking him, 
Show me transparency. He can, he can, he, I'm sure he has it. We can show you how much we spend, all of that's there. But the donors need to mature and say, Alhamdulillah, we'll trust this organization to do that. And I guess for us to start to do that, we need to have, show people, and we're happy to show people as well. But I think uh, over time, they just got to stop that. Allah's given us permission to pay the people that works in the space. Why do you have a problem with it? Exactly. I think if there are any more questions, we'll interact during the dinner. And Maulana Suhail, your concluding remarks. In, in my concluding remarks, um, I would like to share with these many organizations uh, that are here. So at the Shuffle Aid, uh, you know, we have uh, the car framework and then we have the car policies. Uh, we also have a uh, Zakar handbook of how our Zakar is discharged. We also have uh, a Zakar uh, compliance officer. We have over Zakar oversight bodies, uh, muftis, independent muftis uh, that oversee our Zakar. So all those policies, whoever wants it, our framework in, in, in the way that we execute our Zakar, you know, we're more than willing to share with, uh, with any organization uh, that, uh, that requests it, inshallah. My dear sister, regarding with, with donors, I think it's important and imperative for us that within the field, it's, we need to conscientize and we need to educate donors of where they should and advise them as to where they should be donating their funds. Because it's a very dynamic space. Today it's Gaza, tomorrow it's Lebanon, and the day after it's something else. So we need to help donors to conscientize them and advise them where's the best place to add their funds for that moment. That's a very important point. My concluding remarks, I uh, first want to really congratulate Ashraful Aid and truly Maulana Sohilwari is a visionary and a leader within the field. May Allah Ta'ala Azwadal give him and his entire team and Ashraful Aid only greater and greater strength and more and Amen. more achievements inshallah Ta'ala Azwadal. Amen. With regards to the, the, this panel discussion on Zakat, every one of us, we need to educate ourselves and we need to inform ourselves. This is the duty of not only those that are dealing in zakat it is the duty of every muslim any mu'min and any muslim how we've ed educated ourselves with the muslim asail and the rules and re reg regulations with zakat with, with salah and so on in the same manner in the same way we should also make ourselves aware and educate ourselves with regards to the rules and regulations with zakat in doing so it will make it easy for every one of us alhamdulillah at the Alimdar Foundation, we are similar to Ashraf Aid in the sense we also have a panel of ulama, a team of ulama who will vet every single zakat recipient. And after them being vetted and them being happy and pleased, then only is zakat discharged to that recipient. And the, the journey doesn't stop there. Over and above that, there's a lot of advice, there's a lot of mentoring and so on, where we, didn't, we try to help people with sustainable aid. And it's a very fine line between sustainable aid and zakat. But alhamdulillah, it's a very deep discussion. And we hope to engage with that related, inshallah. Barakallahu feek. Jazakallah. Just remember, your zakat is 2.5% of your wealth. But for the, recipient, for the recipient, it's 100% of their wealth. They're not giving 100%. This is what they have. I think they're finding it difficult to figure out the maths right now. <laughs> All right. Jazakallah to everyone.